This morning's sermon will be called Be Strong in the Lord. Be Strong in the Lord. <clears throat> Many of you are familiar with that uh, passage in Ephesians chapter 6 that, that many people turn to in spiritual warfare. Um, you know, there is, as I just prayed, there is a, there's a definite battle waging around us that we don't begin, to, most people do not begin to comprehend or understand. And people that claim to be authorities on it, as I read and listen to some of them, I don't think they understand it very much either, to be honest with you. <clears throat> In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, before God gave us the whole armor of God, He said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And I was thinking about that and praying about that last night because the Lord clearly guided me and directed me there last night in my night prayer. I just can't tell you how many times that I've almost kind of read over that one little verse. And it really put me in the mind of thinking, my goodness, <clears throat> we hear about the whole armor of God a whole lot. And that's really not what the basis of this sermon is about. But I am trying to help you to understand that we are called, I mean, nothing less than soldiers. And the church of Jesus Christ is pitiful and weak. And we have been called to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His mind. You know, the significance of that is... <clears throat> that you can put armor on a soldier, you can give them the best weapons that human beings have ever been created, but if they're not a strong soldier, you're clothing a wimp. <laughs> what good are they going to do if they don't have the countenance to go into battle? The Bible has called us <clears throat> to be strong in the Lord. And because the Bible has called us to be strong in the Lord, that means that God has called us to be strong in the Lord. We've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached, I believe, by any person on this earth that was preached by Jesus Christ. It was His first public sermon. The climax of this sermon, the hinge verse that hinges everything else upon it, is be perfect, for my Father in Heaven is perfect. It almost stands alone by itself right there in the middle of all this sermon because that was his point is for us to be have a, an established and then don't let that verse don't don't let you get grow tired of that verse what that means is he wants you to have an established foundational victory an established salvation in your life that cannot be moved at its very least, it cannot be moved. <clears throat> so often we let the world move us. So often we let the Satan, we let Satan move us. And the reason that he is able to do that, my friends, this morning, because we're not strong in the Lord. We're not nearly as strong as we think we should be. We're not nearly as strong as we should be. We're not nearly as strong as we really think we are. If we were as strong as we think we are, if we were as strong as we really think we are, this town would have already been overcome with the gospel. I'm talking about an established victory that carries definite authority this morning. Nothing more than that. Nothing less than that. Beginning at verse 24 as we close out this great sermon, here was Jesus' conclusion. Therefore, Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended. The floods came. The winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them.
do them. <clears throat> it will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended. The floods came. The winds blew and beat on that house. And it fell and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the, the people were astonished at his teaching. Why were they astonished? For he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. There are many answers <clears throat> found in that text right there. There are many questions about life that you can answer through that text right there. But for the sake of time and attention spans, I'm only going to answer three questions this morning. What must we do to keep constant stability as a Christian? Why do people lose their Christian stability? And finally, who is your authority this morning? And maybe if you really allow the Lord to seek your heart, on that last question, you may be really surprised who truly is your authority this morning. I believe that. I really believe that. Because when I read the early church fathers, Acts chapter 2, the historical accounts of what the church looked like in the freshness of this blessing, we fall short, friends. We fall short of what God has bought for us. I hope that makes you mad this morning. Mad enough to question me on it. Mad enough to go home and allow the Lord to search your heart on it. Mad enough at the devil to get your heart fixed and founded firmly in Jesus Christ. What must we do to keep constant stability? Well, it goes without saying, and in any children's Sunday school lesson, you would probably say, just from reading that text, that we must build our house on the rock. Right? We must build our house on the rock. And that rock is who? That rock is Jesus Christ. Amen? We've all understood that. That's pretty basic Christianity. What must we do to stay consistent as Christians? We must have a firm foundation. We must have a firm foundation. I want to bring your attention to God's chosen people. God's chosen people. Many people believe that there's no sense in reading the Old Testament because it doesn't apply to us very much today. Many of you are probably familiar with this verse, but I was thinking of this, this group of people in whom Jesus sent Moses to free them. <clears throat> they saw many miracles. They'd done many things. But their foundation was not solid. To keep constant stability, we must keep consistently following Jesus. Now, I want to turn your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. To illustrate this point, I thought Scripture would really be a good way to illustrate this point. Jesus, at this point, was not teaching new truth. He was bringing to light old truth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, it says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. And that's as far as I want to go right now. That rock was Christ. You've got to understand as Christians that your soul needs food. You will die if you do not feed your spirit. Let me be blunt about this. If you think that you can come to an altar and pray a one-time good for eternity prayer and never read your Bible, never pray, neglect spiritual discipline, neglect coming to church, my friends, you're not building on the rock. If you're relying upon this church to get you to heaven by church attendance, and you're relying upon this church 
to teach you about the Bible, if you're relying upon this church to guide your prayer life, if you're relying upon anything else than Jesus, you are not building your foundation on the rock. If you are not going home and taking these truths and being inspired to read more and to spend time in the Word by yourself at night, are you doing that? Because if you're not, you're not spent, you're not building your house on the rock. You will fall. Now I believe there's liberty in here this morning. This is a place where the church gathers together and the Holy Spirit of the living God guides us and directs us into truth and makes our life beautiful and He is permeating this place. This is a peaceful, glorious, beautiful place this morning. I can sense the presence of God. But when you walk out those doors, you're in Satan's kingdom. Do you understand that? When you're sitting around with your friends and they're cussing and filth going on in your, in your workplace, you're in Satan's kingdom. Jesus said you've got to not only hear these words, you've got to do them. And the reason that people do not have this constant stability to keep doing them is because you are not feeding your spirit. You are not fit building on a firm foundation. And when you don't build on a firm foundation, you go the way of the world. And the way of the world is Satan's way forever and always. You have to have a firm foundation. When you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you see the story of a people who was delivered from the, from the hands of one of the most oppressive governments of all time. Had millions of Hebrew slaves building religious, <clears throat> religious structures and anything that they wanted. They were so brutal to these people. They were delivered from slavery from the Egyptians. Brought through the Red Sea. God parted a sea so that they could be delivered. Manna came down from heaven so that they could be fed. Jesus, it says right here, Jesus himself was the rock in which they drank on a daily basis. <clears throat> what are you drinking from this morning? Are you hearing God's word and doing it? If you look over at James chapter 1, verse 22, I'm just I'm taking all these illustrations and evidences from the Bible this morning because my opinion doesn't matter upon these things. But there's a kind of faith out there that is not built upon a rock. There's a kind of faith out there that says that once you're saved, you can do anything you want. <clears throat> and that kind of mindset's permeating the, the church, the people, people that don't even believe that. They would never admit that they believe that are beginning to believe that. Even though their head is saying that I would never, ever believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. Their heart is living that way. And in James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25, God foresaw this. Put it in Scripture. This is not a new problem. This is an old problem. For He said, But be doers of the Word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. You're deceiving yourself. If you really think that you can go on and build a foundation that's not firm, you really think you can reject God's Word in your life and still call yourself a Christian, you're deceiving yourself. you completely deceived. That's what the Word of God says. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who observes his natural face in a mirror. He observes his face in a mirror and then forgets what he looks like. You're trying to say that you're following Jesus, but you're going the way of the world. You have to build a foundation of rock below you. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. He has to be the very depth and fiber of your being. And you can get mad if you want. You can get aggravated if you wanted that truth, but that's exactly what a carnal man does. Don't you understand that? We're preaching a victory this morning that frees us from even the desire to not want to follow Jesus. That can be put to death completely and totally. That is the foundation in which we have to build on. And any other foundation is sand. Is sand. It will fall. <clears throat> We must find stability through the trials of life. As Jesus used modern elements, even that, that are timeless, things that we will always have to deal with. Back in Matthew chapter 7, 
Jesus said, and the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house. Well, if you're supposed to be the house, the winds came, the floods come, the, the rain descends. He is talking about the trials of life. What's getting you through the trials of life? What is getting you? What is keeping you? What is keeping you steadfast when things are just not going your way? Young Christians especially just cannot believe that salvation is not about them. It's not about you. It's about the glory of God. It's not about you having a good life and an easy life and a prosperous life. It's about you following Jesus Christ and bringing glory to God. That's what it's all about. Seeking prosperity. Seeking blessings. Seeking having a good life is building your house on sand. And it will fall. Because what happens when things don't work out? What happens when you lose that job? What happens when you lose that family member tragically? What happens? What happens? You walk away from the faith because you've not built your house upon a rock. You have to build your house upon the rock. And you can't feed your soul unless you're being a doer of the word. And that's what Jesus is telling us. That is life to us. We are made in the very image of the Creator. We are created beings. We're made in the very image of God. We are designed to live a life of holiness. That's why we're saved. That is building your foundation on the rock. And you can't do that apart from Jesus Christ. You can't do that apart from not just reading the Word, not just saying a prayer, but earnestly begging God for the grace to be a victor in this present life. That's what it's all about. And Satan has made it about many things. And I'm telling you this morning, I have a palatable hate for him. I hate him above all things. Last night, God really renewed my hate for him. My hate for him. As I see, he's trying to tear down these foreign countries and these voodoo religions. And there's people, even Americans, that are going over there and trying to experience God or these gods, these voodoo gods. And they're allowing these demons to come in and possess them. Satan is a trickster. He is a liar. He is a destroyer of souls. And he preys upon your carnal desires. He preys upon your want for success. He preys upon your want for friends. He preys upon your want to be well liked. He preys upon that. And He makes your life about everything but building your house upon that rock. Have I met peaceful Muslims? I absolutely have. Have I met peaceful Satanists? Yes, I have. Have I met peaceful and joyous and happy homosexuals? I absolutely have. See, Satan is willing to put peace in somebody's life if he has you in some other area. It's not about peace. It's not about joy. It's not about happiness. And it's definitely not about your comfort. Do you like that this morning? Because this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not what it's about. You know what the salvation of Jesus Christ is about? You being saved from an eternal torment and bringing your life into a position where you live such a holy life above the board of this world that God, the only people could say that God has done this. God has done this. And to live your life short of that is not only selling you short of what salvation is, but it's selling God short of the rights that he has on your life. That's the firm foundation that Jesus has called us to live in. Now I'm going to go ahead and say this altar is open at any time during the sermon. If anybody wants to come up here and start praying, there'll be people to come and help you. <clears throat> I just feel like the Lord wanted me to say that. So why do people have not offered such an amazing salvation as that? Why would they lose their Christian stability? How does it happen? They build their faith upon the sand, as Jesus clearly warned about. They build their faith upon the sand. You see, it transcends believing. We have to do more than believe. We have to act. That's what true faith does. There's an unholy trinity out there 
of psychology, and I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go too deep into this. But psychology is one part of that. Government's another. But like I said, I'm going to hold my tongue on this. But as I was thinking about that psychologically, how that has affected our country, how that has affected the Christians in this country, we almost have a different kind of Christianity. Our faith has gotten so complex, and, and in our minds it's getting so complex, it's just not a simple childlike faith because we hear these things like self-motivation, self-esteem, and all of these things. And we try to add that into Christianity, and it's put, made a lot of people build their faith upon the sand. Now, <clears throat> I just want, want to go through this very quickly. And I want to tell you the difference between self-motivation and what the gospel teaches. Self Being self-motivated means that you live a life in your own strength. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, the Word of God says, And He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast of my infirmities than the power of Christ may rest upon me. I want you to think for a minute about self-preservation, which is the gospel of the American church, that God wants to make your life happy and make your life good and make your life all come together. That's building your house on sand. That's called self-preservation. And all it does is lead to greed and covetousness. Especially since Jesus said in this very same sermon in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, you cannot serve both God and man. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and money. You hear that? It's not God's duty to bless you financially. It's God's duty to bless you with self-discipline so that you can save money, be a good steward, but it's not God's duty to bring you all the wealth in the world. That's not what Christian salvation is about. <clears throat> it is especially not about self-esteem, which makes me sick to my stomach when you read some of these modern-day garbage theology books that are coming out. And you listen to some of this junk and trash that is being sung across the radio airwaves that talks constantly about how you are a... How you need to be a better person, you're a good person, just building up the man, building up people, building up people, lessening God constantly. It's self-esteem. Let me tell you something. Christians should not have high self-esteem. Christians should realize that they are worth the cross. You should realize that, and that should humble you. But it's not about being a strong person. You understand that? It says be strong in the Lord, not be a strong person. Be strong in the Lord. It's not about you. It's about Him. Matter of fact, in James chapter 4 and verse 6, it, the Bible says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. In James 4.10, He said again, just four verses later, just in case you missed it, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. We don't need to be teaching kids. We don't need to be teaching adults to have high self-esteem. We need to teach them to humble themselves. Really realize the depths of the sin that you're living in. Really realize how much that you have built your house upon sand. That you are wicked. You are evil. You are a child of hell apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. You understand that? That's what it's all about. And why are we teaching things so differently? Because our standard of truth is going away. <clears throat> Preachers want to be popular instead of holy anymore. And that's a popular message to a carnal person. Hey, you just got to believe in yourself. You just got to pull up your bootstraps and you just got to be a better you. Every day is a Friday. <laughs> it's garbage. And it's anti-gospel. It's anti-God. And see, when you start putting these things together like self-motivation, self-preservation, and self-esteem, now, don't disregard this. Think about it. What happens when you start combining all of those things? You begin to live a life without faith. Because you aren't focused on Jesus anymore. You're focused on your success. And that is a faithless, dead life. 
Well, Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? In Jesus, in James chapter 2 and verse 20, the Word of God says, But do you want to know, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Can you not see that living a life without faith means that you're living a life without obedience? You see that obedience to the Word of God, obedience to Jesus, will cause any person in this room and any person in this world, this is why it's so effective, is because it causes you to die out to you. It causes you to put a death to yourself. Yourself is the very thing that is holding you back. And that's quite a bit different from what you'll hear in a lot of churches today. I won't be brave enough to say most of them, but a lot of them. What is holding you back is you. Quit blaming the devil because Jesus has given us authority over him. Quit blaming your little mistakes that you make and just get things right or vertically with God. It's time for you to just look up, take responsibility, and say, look, nothing good can I bring only to the cross I claim." you really got to have that revelation in your heart. You have really got to see, I don't think that you'll ever be effective. You'll be weak in your ministry until you realize that the people out here that we're ministering to are not good people. They are wicked, vile, wretched people that deserve hell. But Jesus has bought them. Jesus has bought them. He has loved them anyway. And we're called to love them anyway. Until you really grasp and realize the very depths of your sinfulness, you will never be able to love like Jesus loved. You will never be able to be cleansed inwardly. So would you please quit for, for God's sake. Quit using, well, I'm a good person, I just need help excuse. Because Jesus said there are none good but God. And if you're thinking that you're a good person, you just caught a bad rap somewhere, you've not made a man, you have not come in contact with the gospel of Jesus Christ, at least not the power. You haven't. You have to realize the very depths of your depravity in order that you be saved. You have to realize the very depths of the depravity of the people out there in these streets. So that you will run to them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you how wicked humanity is. Let me tell you how wicked you are. The only way that you, that you had a chance in not going to hell for eternity is that the Son of God was nailed to wooden planks and bled out for <clears throat> your sinfulness. That's how wicked you are. And if that doesn't move you, then I don't know what can. You should really, honestly, and truly search your own heart and see where you really stand with Jesus if that doesn't move you. It should concern you above any other concern you have walking in here if that doesn't move you. And as a result of people building their house on this kind of sand, sand is so sifting, it's not stable. All it takes is the wind to blow it and shape it into a mountain. Shape it into a dune. That's all it takes. <clears throat> when these things come against you, not only will you fall, and it's not this kind of fall where it's like, oh, I fell and I'm going to pick me back up again that you hear in modern Christianity. It says, great will be their fall. Great will be their fall. And I don't think people really understand what that day of judgment will look like. I don't think many Christians have really grasped that and what that's going to really be like. To have your life played back to you in front of all of humanity, every secret thing exposed in front of your parents, in front of your loved ones, in front of your friends. Every time that you compromise, you'll be sitting there looking at it and all you can do is cry because you know because of the life that you lived, you are going to hell right as soon as that video is done. 
And I don't think people really understand that. I think a lot of people think, I think people think their last day is going to be like St. Peter meeting them at the gate and seeing if their life's in a book and say, no, you're probably going to have to go over in this line or you're not in the heaven line. Then like some idiot said the other day, and I'm calling him an idiot because this is an idiotic statement. He obviously doesn't have much sense. He said, he said, well, I drink beer too much to be saved and I'll be drinking it in hell. It's <laughs> like, so you're an idiot. You understand what you're saying? You're going to burn in hell forever. There's not even water there. What makes you think a beer is going to be there? People don't understand eternity. People live so temporally, they do not understand eternity. It's forever. There's no appeals court. There's nothing to get you out of it. And God is not judging you on whether or not you paint a good face like you look like, you look like a good Christian and I attend church a lot. That's not part of the judgment. That's a privilege that Christians get to share in. He's going to judge you on every public and secret thing, even the things that are in your heart. Grasp it. That's reality. That's reality. So you've got to ask yourself, in your personal faith, brings us to our last question. You've got to ask yourself, in your personal faith, what has been your Authority. The people were astonished in Matthew chapter 7 because they'd never heard anybody speak like this before. What Jesus said, I, don't, I think a lot of people miss this sometimes. Do you, you ever realize in verse 21 he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven? You know how crazy of a statement that must have been to the Jewish people? Think about it. Well, here's 450 years of utter silence from God that they've been dealt with. And all they had, they never had it. They didn't have a voice from the Lord until John the Baptist came on the scene. And everybody except John the Baptist was an echo. They didn't preach with authority. They just recited the scriptures. But Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. They must have heard that and been like, did you hear what he just said? This guy just claimed to be God. This guy just claimed to have the authority to judge us. And yes, that's true. Matter of fact, he's the only one that has the authority to finally judge us and send us to heaven. He absolutely is. So you need to ask yourself this morning, in this very imperative teaching that I hope that you don't grow dead to, that I hope that you take serious, and I hope that God puts eternity on your eyeballs this morning and really makes you consider, really settles in your heart. Have you built your house on rock? Or have you built your house on sand? Because to build your house on rock would mean that Jesus Christ is your authority. To build your house on the sand means that anything else is. Anything and everything else is. Now, to build your house on the rock is not to build your faith on other people's opinions. It's not to build your faith on your favorite songs. It's not to build your faith upon your favorite authors. Matter of fact, the Bible strictly warns us to test these things. To test the spirits to see if they are from God. Your faith cannot be based upon your opinion. And it's sad to say that many people every Sunday hear sermons just like this one and walk away saying, well, that preacher must not know what he's talking about. Even though I've clearly made a very sound case by the Word of God that the Word is your rock. The Word of God is your rock. So is your Christian opinions, is the authority of your faith coming from this book or is it coming from this heart? Is it coming from what the words of this book say or is it coming from personal experience? You see, I experienced God in different ways as a young Christian that I look back now and say that was a total and utter lie. I felt really good about my faith when I was backslidden. 
My feelings are worthless to me. I really mean that. I really mean that. They're almost, and I'll say almost, worthless. Now, I don't want a religion that don't have feeling. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if you're relying upon your emotional stability to lead you into truth, you are going to be sorely mistaken. Many times. Many times. Especially as a young Christian. And you realize something, those of you that hate authority, you know you're always going to be under it. <laughs> you know you're always going to be under it. You're always going to have somebody you got to answer to. And even if you have your own business and you have your own job and all, and all these things, you still got to pay taxes. There's still the IRS out there. Hey, while you live in this country, you're always going to live under the United States government. And while you're in this county, guess what? We have a sheriff, we have a police force, we have state troopers. You're always going to be under some sort of earthly authority. It's best to just, as the Bible says, go ahead and submit to it. Anytime you have a job, you're going to have a manager. You're going to have a boss. You're always going to be under authority. <clears throat> but even with somebody who thinks that they're just going to be a good hippie and go out and live out in the middle of the woods for the rest of their life and not have any human contact and live in a van and live off the land and do what some of these people are doing nowadays, you're still under authority. You understand that? You see, primarily, we're all under one or, one or the other authority. You're either under the authority of Satan or you're under the authority of Jesus Christ. You're all, you'll never be able to escape that. And you have to reckon in your heart which one you're going to follow. Are you going to follow the truth of God or are you going to reject it and go your own way? Because there's a hell prepared for people like that that want to just do things their way and want to be absent from God their whole life and want to do their own thing. Well, there's a place prepared for you that you can be absent from God for the whole rest of your the whole rest of eternity. Something to be very pleasant. You're going to realize real quick how many of the very common everyday blessings like the air you breathe and the water you drink, the little necessities that we take for granted, how miserable you're going to be for eternity without them. You're always, always, always going to be under authority. So why wouldn't you be under an authority that you trust? Why wouldn't you be under the authority of the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> See, the scripture here talks about the winds coming. Well, Jesus talked of a wind that we desperately need and we all can get. And in chapter 3 of John and verse 7, when Nicodemus came to him, he said, Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it. But cannot tell where it comes from, where it goes, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. We need the wind of the Holy Spirit. That He has to be our authority in our life. The Holy Spirit has inspired the words in this book. He can help you understand them. He is the authority for the Christian. He will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. Which brings me to another position of authority. What is your authority? Is your authority truth or is it opinion? Contrary to popular belief, there is not, well, that's true for you, but that's not true for me. That's not truth. That's an opinion. We're just calling it truth now. Is your opinions about Christianity lining up with God's truth? And then you wonder why there's no victory in your life. <laughs> How many times have you ever thought just to open up the Word of God and find out the truth about a certain subject on how you should believe it? That would settle all this controversy right now in some of the church denominations for trying to figure out if gay marriage is legal or not in their denomination. How many people are actually seeking truth and seeing what the Bible says that Christians, it's not an option on whether or not we believe it. It's not an option on whether or not we believe that, that abortion is murder. The truth tells us that Jesus knew us and formed us in the womb. It's not an option. It's not an option to depart from sin. Jesus told us, go and sin no more. These things are not optional. They are vital. Another truth I want to share with you. Jesus said, John 17 and 17, last, last prayer that the Son of God prayed before He was crucified. 
Sanctify them by your truth. He prayed that. To sanctify them by your truth. You know what? Coming under the authority of the Holy Spirit, being guided by this book, in my own personal life, led me to being filled with the Holy Spirit and cleansed from all inward sin. I had no idea about it. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand what had happened to me at the time. And I didn't have to. But because I hungered and thirsted for God and realized that there's a deeper need in my own soul that He can meet, He met it. And He met it gloriously and wonderfully. There is your authority. Jesus said it. You must be sanctified. He actually forbid the early church to go out and minister until the Holy Spirit had come upon them. You realize that? Jesus said that. Why are we trying to do it backwards? Why did I try to do it backwards? My ministry didn't bear much fruit at all until that happened to me. If, if at all. Why did I do it backwards? Because this was not my authority of truth. I'm just being real with you this morning. Let me tell you something else. The fullness of that blessing that we're talking about, it is not just boldness, but it also comes with a broken heart. I don't think that anybody who has ever been filled with the Holy Spirit has not been broken for lost people. I don't even think that's, I don't even think that's remotely possible. I don't know how you could have the heart of God and not be sincerely concerned for the lost, for those that are dying and going to hell. How could you do that? How could you say that's part of that blessing? How could you say you have that blessing and not be sincerely moved for people dying and going to hell? <clears throat> you must be burdened with love. That's what love does. Love fills you with a burden for others. That's the power behind the ministry of the gospel is that you have the answer to keep people from building their house on sand. Why wouldn't you walk over glass to go do that? Well, I'll tell you why. If you're a Christian today and you don't have that desire in your heart, you're lacking in your Christian experience. You're building your house on sand. You may have been filled with the Holy Spirit at one point in your life, but you ain't now if you don't have a burden for the lost. That's all there is to it. If you're not burdened for a sick and dying and hell-bound humanity, you don't have the heart of God. He wants to give it to you. But you don't understand His love. Without this authority in your life, without Jesus' authority in your life, you're bound to go the other direction at 100 miles an hour. <clears throat> Is God's Word truth to you this morning? Is that your only avenue of truth? Because here's what God's Word says about the Christian experience. Now may the God of Himself Peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body, that's your whole man, everything about you, be filled with the glory of God. Be filled with the light of God in a dark and sinful humanity. Let me remind you, was it not Jesus who said, be perfect for my Father in heaven is perfect. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm just trying to help you understand. This is what we need. <clears throat> you shall be perfect. There is such thing as a perfect Christian. And it's probably below the standard of what you're thinking in your head. But it's God's finished work in you. To make you completely yielded to Him. In complete, and in a completed state of authority, in a completed state of truth, you're able to stand with confidence, not only in front of a sinner, but on the day of judgment, knowing that you've done all that you can to stand. And the Bible tells us of that kind of experience with God. The Bible set that as the standard <clears throat> of Christians. And we live so far below that standard because people are afraid of religious fanaticism. They're afraid of really seeing what the Holy Spirit could do in their church. 
They're really afraid that the Holy Spirit will show up because most of the people would leave. And that's the sad reality of most churches today, I think. They're afraid to confront sin. They're filled with fear. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says about that. Perfect love casts out all fear. And that's what the Bible says about that. So where is your authority this morning? <clears throat> Have you built it on the sand? Or are you building it on the rock? I'm not talking about religious fanaticism here. I'm talking about reasonable Christianity. Reasonably. Wouldn't it be reasonable that the Lord would want to supply a total victory from every work of the devil in your life this morning? Knowing what we know about Jesus, what does your spirit tell you? What has God's word told you this morning? Wouldn't it be reasonable that he would want you to have a firm foundation of salvation and victory in your life this morning? That seems reasonable to me. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be reasonable that if disobeying God brings destruction in your life, brings that kind of just immeasurable destruction in your life, wouldn't it seem reasonable that God would want you to do would do a work in you that enables that enables you to keep His commands and obey Him without any hesitation? Wouldn't that seem reasonable this morning? That seems reasonable to me. You know, your salvation couldn't be merited. You couldn't earn it. Nobody in here can earn our salvation. It was given to us. There's no such thing as spiritual growth without that either. Thirdly, <clears throat> wouldn't it seem reasonable that God would enable the Sermon on the Mount kind of life that we've been going over the last six weeks? Wouldn't, he, wouldn't it seem reasonable that He would want to enable that kind of life through you by His Holy Spirit that are able to forgive your enemies, that are able to, live, well, able to live above sin, able to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, able to love your neighbor as yourself, able to always put others before you, not because you're trying to build a reputation, but because, just because you love Jesus and you love Him that much. It's not just reasonable, my friends. It's scriptural. And I believe God wants to do that work in people. I believe even this morning, I believe there are people right here in this group of people that you have been lying to yourself for a long time about your faith. I really do. I really think that Satan has got some of you so pinned down and condemned that you are afraid to even try to walk with Jesus. I believe that some people, even in this room, has lived in sin so long, you've got no desire to read the Word, you've got no desire to pray, you've got no desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit. None of that even sounds like something you would want. Well, I'm here to tell you today that that is a lie from the enemy. And I'm here to tell you today that God can break any chain, whether it be disobedience, spiritual warfare, or any other weight and terror, any other hindrance in your life, any habitual sin, anything that is keeping you from victory, <clears throat> if you will come with faith as a grain of a mustard seed, God will meet you where you are and deliver you, and I mean deliver you, into a place of righteous obedience, if you will let Him do that this morning. So we're going to stand and sing 297. <clears throat> and if you really feel like in your heart that there's any reasonable doubt, <clears throat> there's any kind of doubt at all, that you're not where you should be in your faith, you don't have to walk out of this church. If you walk out of this church this morning with a message that clear, then it's on you, friends. It's on you. You know right now where you stand with God. So if you're not standing firm on that foundation, and if you've built your house on sand, <clears throat> you can come up here right now, get reunited, get united for the first time, get filled and can meet every spiritual need upon this altar <clears throat> this morning. So let your needs be made known. We sing, Spirit, 